All right. Stacy Alvarez. Here. Renee Tillman. Here. Joanne Lycom. Here. George Ann McNabb. Here. Justin Collier. You're muted, Justin. There you go. Justin, you there? I see him. We'll come back to Justin. TJ Reigns. Present. Gail Zumwalt. Here. Nevada Smith. We do have a quorum. Are there any public comments? Yes, I did receive uh, one public comment from Mr. Arnie Dinoff. We received that at 2.59 this afternoon and I did email those all out to the uh, trustees, but I will read those for you right now. Uh, Tuesday, November 10th, 2020, reference District Board of Trustees meeting, 11 10, 20. Members of the Library Board of Trustees, during these trying times of COVID and meeting the demands of public and community, I appreciate everything that staff and the library workers out at the branches in our neighborhoods are giving their all each and every day. We and U.S. trustees owe these staff members a great deal of gratitude for serving us, the public of St. Charles County. We are all in this together. I have been testifying before the St. Charles County Council and the county executive in my willingness to serve my county and being appointed a member of the Library District Board of Trustees. There are several vacancies on the board and I ask that you assist me in being appointed to this important board that services and provides value to our great county. Our library district is on the cutting edge and we need to keep striving in finding innovative and new ways to service our very diverse community going from urban, suburban, rural, and everything in between. Financial overview which I'm assuming is in uh, reference to the presentation at the end of our meeting. I would like to caution the board of trustees and the district to be ultra conservative during these trying times of COVID. We need to maintain a fiscal responsible budget and spending habit. I ask that the board of trustees not take on any additional debt or major projects until the economy is stable and we figure out what effect COVID will have on our community this winter and through the spring. I wish each and every one of you a great Thanksgiving holiday, that we cherish what we have, our families, friendships, neighbors, and our great county. Very truly yours, Arnie C. A. C. Dinoff, County Public Advocate. And we thank Mr. Dinoff for his comments. Uh, I think I heard uh, you say, Mr. Director, that you wanted to make some introductions before we continued. Sure, yeah. First, I want to uh, welcome Renee Tillman and TJ Raines, our two um, newly appointed board members. So hello to both of you. Um, actually, did you want to each kind of, you know, say a sentence or two about yourself? Sure, sure. I can start. That's all right with you, Renee. Yeah. All right. Hi, I'm TJ Raines. I'm, uh, I currently serve as Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer at Lindenwood University. And I've been a uh, resident of the county for about six years now, and uh, I'm very excited to serve on the on the board. Uh, you know, libraries have always been an important part of my life. My mother was a library uh, librarian, not a library, but uh, she was librarian for about 20 years. So I grew up in a library, worked many many jobs as a high schooler in libraries, and uh, in my academic career, I also served uh, in managing academic libraries at higher education institutions. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Thank you. My name is Renee Tillman. I am the executive director of the St. Charles County branch uh, the, of the YMCA, which is a part of the Gateway Region YMCA. We are 25 branches strong and uh, Tiffany and LB probably know all about that. Uh, I'm a mother of three, a grandmother of two. I have lived in the county for a couple of years now, but I've worked in the county for over 16 years and been with the YMCA for 20 plus years now. And very excited to uh, be appointed to this board and to help our community and give back. 
what I'm here for. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. We're delighted to have you. Welcome aboard the board. <laughs> um, the, uh, is there anyone else, anything else you wanted to say, Jason? Um, well, I would also just to the, the two of you introduce the library's executive team. So just wave when I say your name um, and I'm going to go in the order that you're on my screen. But um, um, Lori St. Laurent is the deputy director and chief customer experience officer at the library. Um, Julie Wolf is the CFO. Um, Tiffany Barkey is the chief talent officer and Lori Beth Crawford is our chief communications and engagement officer. So, and you will all be hearing from them at some point in the future, I'm sure. Are any of you in the same room? We are not. We are not, okay. Three of us are in the same building, but not in the same room. Okay. Um, if that if that's, uh, concludes all of our introductions, we'll go to reports and correspondence. And I would like to call upon our CFO to uh, present the financial report. Great, I will um, speak to the main summary page, which is our year to date performance um, for brevity. So if you take a look at that actual year to date in our revenue section, um, we really are on track. We've got an additional 100 plus thousand dollars right now um, due to the fact that the state of Missouri gave us our state aid assistance and our arts and entertainer um, income tax assistance. Uh, we did not budget for that because uh, due to the pandemic, we weren't sure what the Missouri state budget was going to look like. So um, we do have that in there. If you notice for the, the newcomers, there's a large difference between where we are year to date and our fiscal 21 budget. So that's due to the fact that we do not get the bulk of our revenues until January um, after taxes are collected. So for real and personal property taxes. So we await eagerly uh, those funds come January to see where we're, we're going to be. Um, because of course, as a public entity, we're required to have a balanced budget. So with that being said, we've taken a conservative approach in our expenditure section to date. Um, so salaries and benefits, we're running at about 93% of year to date. We've had a flexible staff um, with the pandemic. They've uh, been teleworking, they've moved uh, flexibly from branch to branch, things of that nature. So um, we've been doing quite well in that area. Materials, we're on target. And then you'll see in the technology and the other operations area where we're uh, conserving slightly, it's like due to the pandemic. Um, our capital outlay, those are the projects. We've been conservative uh, with the project section, um, except for those projects that started pre-pandemic. So we've got a Cliffview branch in Wentzville that's being constructed. We've got some Kathleen Linneman work that's uh, being done. And we also have an administration building expansion project that we've uh, been working on. So it's not reflected year to date yet, but um, they are in process. Uh, and you'll see that by year end as far as those capital expenditures. So I uh, am open for any questions. Um, you've got the detail. There's a, a lot in the report. so. There's something that you would like me to um, explain or, or you know, go over further. I'd be happy to. Are there Joanne, any comments, questions? This is Joanne. I, um, either for Julie or Jason. Um, I don't know how much you're tracking what's going on in Jeff City, but state just journal entried um, a billion two hundred and seventy-seven million into the current budget. So you might check if there's any other CARES funding available that you might be able to latch on to. Okay. Thank you, Joanne. I've got two other items. Um, I'm concluding the field work as far as our fiscal 20 audit since our fiscal year is July through June. Um, we've got a finance and audit committee. Um, once the draft financials are ready, it's like they're uh, to be discussed with the finance and audit committee those financial statements do need to be adopted at the next Board of Trustees meeting. Um, by law, they have to be submitted by the end of December. So that's in process. And lastly, um, loggers. I have an update for that since I was um, 
appointed the delegate. Uh, they had their recent yearly conference. The logger system is our public pension system for the state of Missouri. Um, they manage $8 billion in assets. So part of that, their office is out of Jeff City. Um, they consist of cities, special districts like uh, the library district, ambulance districts, um, all of the public entities. They manage $8 billion of assets and the library participates in that program. Um, it covers our full-time employees. So uh, I attended their annual meeting. So with managing $8 billion in assets, um, our responsibility as an employer is we've got our contribution for our full-time employees that we make yearly. Um, so it's really important to hear they manage uh, that $8 billion investment pool with, they manage it actively. So whether it's uh, real assets, um, equities, things of that nature, um, they are dependent on a seven and a quarter percent return on those assets so that they can adequately fund the pension plan. Um, so basically 65% of the loggers plan is dependent on that. The remainder sits with the employers basically their contribution on behalf of the employees. So in the past year, they've had three times as normal number of employers join the state of Missouri plan than they have traditionally. So um, it's growing. Um, they've done a tremendous job supporting it. They've got tremendous um, investment managers. What they did announce is that every five years, um, their actuaries take a look at the assumptions that they've made for each employer. Um, they review those and they decide whether they need to make some changes. So this happens to be the year for that. So they acknowledge that employers have already done their budgeting for fiscal 21. So through the month of December, the actuaries will review and update those assumptions. And then for the fiscal 22 budget year, they're releasing new contribution rates to all of the employers. Uh, based on those assumptions. So that's really where we sit. Um, we will go into our fiscal 22 budgeting set our season, basically January and February. So that's coming up quickly. So that will impact that. So just wanted to give you that quick update on where we are there. So if you have any questions. No questions. It's a very thorough report, Julie. Thanks very much. Oh, you're welcome. The update. Uh, we'll move to the director's report. Jason? All right, thank you. Um, really highlighted at the beginning some of the, um, the progress on the building projects that Julie mentioned um, that also started pre-pandemic, um, but they continue largely on schedule. Um, we note there with, with Cliffview in, in Wentzville, there are some delays um, that we're experiencing but it doesn't really impact um, the, a planned opening, which, which remains on track for early 2021. Um, our Discovery Village location had its, I guess, successful last day on October 31st. Um, we are on track to have the, the property vacated um, at the time the lease expires at the end of, of this month. Um, and on that page right there, I'm happy to report we do have a tentative timetable now for the work at the Catherine Linneman location um, that, that sort of started this, this chain of events when the branch took on water in May. So I think we share the frustration that it has been slow going. Um, we really have been bold into the work of the engineers and their own timetable and the other work that they have going on. But so we now know that the work should begin by Thanksgiving um, and looking at three to four weeks for the exterior work, um, the waterproofing work that has to be done on the outside and about five to six weeks for the work on the interior. Some of that can be done concurrently. Some of the interior work does depend on the exterior work being done. Um, there are other things that can be going on in the branch. As I mentioned, we did um, complete the carpet in the, the teen room, which you see there in the report. The furniture is being delivered soon. So there is work that is happening, but we are 
are hoping for everything to be completed mid-January and looking at an early February reopening. Um, Lori Beth has already brought up, um, are we going to do a reopening celebration? So we have something, you know, we've started planning for that and we will certainly be celebrating when that happens. Um, really what I wanted to spend the most time talking about though was really our, what we've experienced these last couple of days um, in terms of response to having possible exposures uh, to COVID within our branches. And I put in the written report, the results of our survey of staff that we conducted um, within these past few weeks to really get some idea of how our staff was feeling about our approach to um, to opening in, in library operations in this, this pandemic environment that we're in. And um, for those of you that don't know, most of the, the sort of day-to-day -day operational pieces of our reopening was led by a return to service team that consisted of um, really led by our four general purpose branch managers and then a number of staff from across the organization because we really wanted them to be able to to tell us what challenges they would be facing and really have a key role in planning how we would um, serve the community in this environment. And I am happy that by and large, the, the overall um, tone of the responses to the survey was generally staff do feel um, positively about the approach. Um, as you can expect, um, this is this is an issue that there are a lot of a lot of differences of opinion on. And so we did receive responses to questions that were sort of on, on each end of the spectrum in terms of, you know, we should be completely closed. We should be completely open with no restriction. So um, it is it is hard to balance when there's viewpoints that differ that widely, but we have tried to maintain sort of a steady middle of the road approach. Um, by and large, we have been fortunate in terms of having um, staff um, exposure to COVID or positive tests be very, very limited up until recently. Um, but as I sent out in an email to you over the past week or so, we have had um, a few. And as you know, the McClay branch is closed. We are looking to reopen it for curbside only starting Thursday. And the reason for that is not that the building is unsafe or not that everyone in the building um, tested positive for COVID. It's that we are taking a very conservative approach in terms of um, staff who were potentially exposed to all quarantining for 14 days. So, um, and that leaves, depending on the situation and, and was the case at McClay, um, that's the majority of the staff. So at this point, um, that's that's why the branch remains closed. It's why we can open beginning Thursday, but curbside only. That's the the highest staffing level that we can get from other locations in the district who will be going to to McClay to work. So, and that is generally going to be our our approach in situations moving forward. We will clean the building. We will assess um, you know staff exposure and 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 contact and ask those with that had closer contact for longer periods of time, which is generally going to be most staff who who may have worked with an individual to quarantine for 14 days. So everything will be looked at on a case by case basis, but that is generally the approach that we're going to take. Um, we don't know what the future holds. Um, obviously, you know, we we can get by when we have one branch exposure, but if we start to have multiple it might mean multiple locations will have to be closed simply because we don't have enough staff to fill those locations. So, um, but I think we've shown that we can act swiftly and we will act swiftly and um, really with the, with the safety of the public and staff um, paramount. So that's really what I wanted to cover. I am happy to answer any questions about this or anything else that you might have. You've really made some remarkable accommodations. It's, uh, it's not an easy task, I know. Well, and, and I want to compliment the entire staff um, for their flexibility. I know it's, it's 
it, this is a challenging time and they have shown they are able to change directions on a dime. They are able to adapt. Um, so, I mean, really kudos to, to everyone. I would say well, well deserved. Are there any questions or comments? I have one quick question. Um, due to the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and whatnot, have you, have you seen an increase in uh, digital material access? Yes, yes we have. Um, and we will get to the statistical report next, but yeah, so looking at year to date, our e-media is up 23% um, access. And, and that has been a trend in libraries for, for years now, um, but we have seen it is definitely growing at a higher at a higher rate um, now. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, Georgiana, Great. it's Joanne. Can you hear me? Yes, go. Um, Jason, unfortunately, I had a sound glitch and had to go out and back in, so I missed much of what you just said, but one one question I had was, are, are we utilizing or have we looked at any kind of um, UV um, cleaning aspects? Uh, I know that that's not really feasible with very large spaces, but at least in uh, some of the smaller spaces or with regard to the materials, um, have we investigated the usefulness of that? Yeah, we, we have looked at it a bit and I, you know, I've talked to other libraries and, and really there's not widespread use of, of UV equipment in libraries. The focus really, and, and I mentioned in the report a little bit too, there was early on when there were a lot more unknowns of a pretty significant focus on quarantining materials and can the virus be transmitted from materials that are being returned by by patrons to the branch and as as we've learned more and more it's become more and more clear that surface transmission is not the real danger um it, it's airborne transmission in close contact with infected individuals so um i mean really the 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 best approach that that libraries are taking is to quarantine materials for a period of time but do pretty routine cleaning of high touch areas like computer screens and, and various surfaces. Um, right. And we're doing that, but we have we have not um, done anything with with UV. Okay, just wondered. Are there any areas where you really have needs that are not able to meet right now? Um. I don't think so, knock on wood. I think the, the biggest, like I said, the biggest sort of unknown is what's going to happen over winter. And I think we're all sort of fearful of, of that. We know, you know, the Sam Page in St. Louis County gave his press conference yesterday. It, it seems to be their heading um, to a possible closure of the county. So. I mean, it, it's really balancing if we have multiple locations where we have exposures and a significant number of staff need to quarantine, mm -hmm. if we're able to continue to maintain services, or do we roll back to only doing um, curbside for a period of time? Is the county moving toward a closure? Um, <laughs> I, I would say just from the tone of the remarks that were made, it I, I would it does seem that they're leaning that way. I, I, St. Louis County, I, I don't know. Um, right. St. Charles, I, I have no um, information at this point. Right. Okay. So St. St. Georgian, St. Yeah. St. Charles County is not moving to closure. Okay. That's um, right. Yeah. St. Charles County is officially asking its citizens and, and engaging in a education campaign and what will soon be a stepped up education campaign about the importance of masks, personal cleanliness, especially with regard to touch points, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the 
keyboards, elevator buttons, et cetera, uh, personal distancing, and, um, you know, just understanding that um, uh, all of this is to keep the economy open, the schools open, and uh, very much to keep healthcare um, able to meet the needs of our citizens. The, the hospitals are emphasizing to the county executive that things are um, at a very high stress level in all of the county located hospitals and across the entire St. Louis area. And that they have nowhere else to turn for additional staff and um, locations and that the number of COVID patients in ICUs is rising. Not so much ventilator use, they've been telling us over and over that they've figured out things to keep people off ventilators, but um, they are, they're very worried about uh, the sheer volume of doctors and nurses. Right. So, um, you know, as we've been telling our own staff over the last 48 hours, whatever sphere of influence you have, um, then you should use it to ask people to be compliant with those standards. Um, Dr. Page did start speaking last Friday about something that we've also been trying to add to our messaging, which is to know kind of the sphere of your contacts and be prepared that if somebody gets sick within that, that you can um, self-contact trace. And, and um, we're just seeing a lot of, especially in St. Louis County and not so much here, but we are starting to get more non-compliance with the public, working with public health about, about um, quarantining and contact tracing. So, but no, we are not heading to a shutdown. Good, that's good. Just generally, Sorry, general, general observation, and more so increasingly, I think, merchants and individuals seem to be more cognizant and following the guidelines than, than previously in, in our county, in St. Charles County. Oh, that's good. Any, any other discussion on the subject? If not, we'll move to uh, uh, Jason, if you'd like to walk us through the statistical report. Yeah, and, and I won't um, cover everything because it's a, it's a lot of the same trends that we've seen. And, and obviously when we have, you know, we're open 30% fewer hours, um, we're going to see um, impacts to service. But um, to TJ's point, um, we are continuing to see increases in e-media use. So um, a 23% increase year to date. And, um, and really our, our overall circulation is only down 14%. So considering the circumstances, I actually think that's, that's really, really good. Um, the one area that I, I think is interesting is, is our gate count or the, the people, I, I say through the doors, but it also includes people at curbside and at drive through So literally anyone physically using a facility in any capacity um, is down 52, over 52 and a half percent year to date, which is greater than the number of hours that were reduced. And I mean, there are certainly some reasons we're not doing any in-person classes and events. So that's one reason why people would come to a building that they don't need to come to a building. So that is certainly part of it. Um, you may have seen that we issued a, um, a survey to the community though last week. And as those results have started to come in, I was surprised by a number of people that commented that they're not using the library because of fears of COVID. So I, I think it's probably a bit more prevalent than I thought um, because I certainly see people in stores and things that there are people out there that are, are still hesitant to use our facilities and honestly, we occasionally get a comment and there were some on there of people that don't think, don't realize that we're open. So um, I, I, I think there's probably a number of factors, but I think it does bear, bear, bear watching that um, P, 
people are getting their library service in different ways. And um, that may, as the longer this sort of goes on and we're operating in this environment, it's interesting to just think how that will impact our service going forward, even when we're out of um, this immediate situation. Um, but beyond that, um, that's really what I wanted to highlight. Um, happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, if not, we can move to correspondence, reference the customer email that dated November 3rd, 2020. Jason, you want to comment? Uh -huh. Sure. Um, we received, or, or the trustees received, um, an email directed to the trustee account um, last week. And um, just as a reminder, there is a board, a generic board account, and um, that's on our website. And it says any correspondence will be distributed to the board um, at their monthly meeting. So, um, but I did email it out with some comments um, last week. And just, just generally, um, it, it, this isn't in necessarily an uncommon comment to encounter in a public library um, where someone encounters material that, that surprises them or that they don't necessarily, um, I guess, think is appropriate. And, and in this case, um, the specific, and, and we, we actually don't know the specific title, um, but the specific type of material was manga, which is graphic novels, they're from Japan. Um, we probably see more comments about this type of material than, than others, and it's for a couple of reasons that it, they're, they're visual. And um, so people tend to um, react differently to, to visual formats instead of written ones. And also because they're from Japan, every culture has sort of different cultural norms of what's appropriate for different age groups. So um, we, we do see comments about the subject matter a little bit more frequently with this type of material. And I just want to just cover very generally, um, just libraries are pretty universal in their approach to the issue of sort of labeling or designating materials, um, and, and I'll use explicit because that's the one, um, the, the one that was used here. And so as an, as an aid to finding materials, we, we put materials in, in very broad age categories. So, you know, it really used to be children's and adults, and that was it. And then more recently, libraries have tended to have materials specifically for teens, some go a little further and there'll be a tween collection, but those are meant as a general aid to, um, to help people navigate the materials and find what's most suitable for their reading level. Um, it doesn't mean that a child might read at a higher level and might use things in the adult collection or the other way around. Um, they're just meant as general guides. Um, it's pretty universal, though, that libraries resist the idea of sort of tagging or restricting based upon sort of content or subjective markers like what is explicit. And a um, couple of reasons. The, the, the biggest one to me is we can't know what is appropriate for any individual, right? And I will say as a, as a parent of a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old, my wife and I disagree sometimes about what is appropriate, what we think is appropriate for our kids. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that the library is an institution, but there would probably be multiple people within that institution sort of assigning subjective levels of what is appropriate that applies to the entire county um, just doesn't, it, it, it isn't our role. And we really need to depend on um, parents to do that for their kids. We cannot, and we do not serve in local parentis. Um, so, and I, I don't, I, you have the, the policy there and I don't want to sit and, and, and kind of talk about this a lot. Um, you know, I, I can understand a, a parent or anyone seeing something and for them, they think, well, hey, why, you know, why, why was my child allowed to take this out? In this case, I believe the child is 12 years old. 
this material would have come from either the teen or the adult section. So already it was in a higher age category probably, um, or that she was kind of right on the, the, the cusp. Um, but when, you, when you, you carry that through further, there's any number of subject matters that some will find controversial and some won't. Um, there's different levels for different people and there's different appetites um, and so forth. So um, libraries, it, it really is sort of a, a guiding principle of libraries to make their materials available. I've, I've said it in a, in a previous meeting that, you know, if, if writers write something and publishers publish it and readers want to read it, it's the library's job to have it and to allow our taxpayers to make the decisions for themselves what is appropriate for them or their kids in the case of minors. So um, I am, I'm, you know, happy to talk about this more. This is kind of my, as a librarian, this is, this is my, my bread and butter here. Um, but in, in terms of response, one of the things that, that I noted in what I wrote to you is Lori actually spoke with the mother of this individual at about the same time ish that the father sent this to the board. So I don't know if this was sent to the board as a response, you know, knowingly that Lori had that they weren't satisfied with with Lori's response, or if it just happened at the same time, two different venues. So I am happy to respond on behalf of the trustees if it would be your pleasure to have me do that kind of along these same lines or um, to handle it any way you choose. I would have no problem with that. How the rest of you feel? Uh, uh, can I speak? This is Gail. Mm -hmm. Please, please. Um, I wanted to, and Georgia, and you may remember too. We had this issue a number of years ago. It became a a big deal because we had parents actually arguing that their children weren't able to check books out. And they wanted them to be able to select their own. And we went through this and none of us was really happy about, you know, the children accessing some of the literature that they were accessing. But again, the parents said, this is my choice, not yours. We do not want to be governed. We want right. to tell our children what they can look at. We don't want you telling them what they can see and do. So you've been, I feel like uh, Jason has inherited that decision from the board a while back. And of course we've changed members of the board, but I still feel, and I, I didn't really, uh, as, as a parent and now a grandparent, I really would like to know that it's safe to send my kids out or my grandchildren out to pick things out. But it really can't be up to the rest of the world to tell them what they can read and what they can see and do. We really have to monitor it as the individual. So uh, anyway, I just, I really wanted to remind the board that that was a decision that we faced and it, we really went through rack and ruin over it at the time. It's hard. Right. So that's it. Thank you. And thank you, Jason. I think it was a very good answer and it's a good response and you would have my vote for that. Well, and I will say every library board has dealt with this at some point. I mean, this is, this, like I said, this truly is sort of the bread and butter of librarianship, um, intellectual freedom and the freedom of readers, or again, in the case of a minor, their parents to um, choose their own material. And and you said something there, Gail, that, that did remind me of, a, of another piece. You used the word um, safe. and the the other issue that you get into when you start assigning objective categories is your you know what who whomever is applying that standard that's their standard and yes. by doing it you're implying that might imply something to someone else that something that doesn't meet that person's standard you know what I mean? you're, you're actually implying a level of safety there and and even that okay well as a parent i no longer the library's taking care of it for me so i don't have to monitor as closely and that's absolutely not true so i almost feel like it, it's counterproductive in in some ways 
um, because you're, you're sort of telling parents that they, they don't have to continue to monitor what their children are reading. And, and we would absolutely never advocate for that. I agree. I agree. Well, I feel very comfortable with your uh, response, Jason, if the rest of the board concurs and you're comfortable. Yeah, I, I need to take yeah. a vote on that. Pardon me? Do we need to take a vote on that? I think TJ started to say something, so I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I, I think. I think your your response, Jason, was was spot on, and uh, also referencing the collection management policy, I think, would be very helpful to uh, just state that you know this is a policy of the organization, and it's well supported by the board. Are you comfortable with that, Jason? Yeah, I am. I'm I'm happy to do it. Um, the collection management policy does also point out there there is a a means by which any member of the public can request reconsideration of a material a specific um, material as well. So that would be an option um, for them to pursue about a specific um, item in the collection as well. Right. Sounds good. Any other questions or comments? I don't think we need to vote on that. My feeling. Anyone else disagree? I, I sense. A I don't think we need to vote as long as we all agree. I, I sense a consensus. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, that concludes the report section of our meeting. And in concluding, I really would like to express for the board, on behalf of the board, Jason, all of the work that you and the staff are doing. I think it's the yeoman's work in view of very difficult circumstances. So thank you very much from all of us. Thank you. And, and I mean, I appreciate that. And the staff certainly does. I'll pass that along to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, consent agenda. I assume that everyone has had a chance to review the, uh, the minutes of the October 13, 20 meeting. Are there any amendments? I know that I think Robin received one response and that was to concur and I don't believe there were any others that I'm aware of. Um, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the minutes of the October 13, 2020 meeting. Right? Second? Yes. I second. Okay. Any discussion further? If not, um, those voting to approve say aye. 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 Against? Abstain? The motion is passed. Um, formal agenda that being, since there's no old business, we'll move right to new business. And before we start addressing the agenda items, I think that um, Jason, you wanted to make some comments. So I turn the floor to you. Sure. Um, so we have, um, I mean, we're, we're, Happy to welcome um, Renee and TJ to the board, uh, but that also means that we are losing two wonderful um, trustees who have served um, this library for a very long time in Myra Crook and Mary Reese. Um, I, did, I didn't put it on the memo because there's an off chance that it, it wasn't entirely accurate, but from what we can tell, Myra is the longest standing um, trustee in the district's history and um, Mary is um, close on her heels. So um, obviously they were both board, board members when I was hired. So I personally um, want to thank them for their service. And um, we have prepared resolutions honoring that service. And I will turn that back over, I believe, to Robin will read those. I will. And I just wanted to make two comments. Uh, Myra has joined us so she is online with us and also justin uh, collier has been on the meeting since we started he can hear us 
but he's having some uh, microphone issues. So he is uh, sending me his votes by email. So I just wanted you to know that he is on. Um, all right. So oh, agenda 2114. Yes. Resolution in honor of Myra Kirk. Yes. Please, if you would read it. I would be glad to. Resolution in honor of Myra Crook. Whereas Myra Crook has distinguished herself through her service to the St. Charles City County Library District, District as an appointee from the County of St. Charles to the Library Board of Trustees from 2006 to 2020. And whereas Myra Crook, during her tenure as a trustee, held the offices of Secretary, Vice President, and President of the Board. And whereas Myra Crook was instrumental in the recruiting process for new library directors in 2010 and 2017. And whereas Myra Crook, while serving as vice president and president of the board, led the trustees during the construction of the Spencer Road branch. And whereas Myra Crook served as a member of the Library Foundation Board from 2015 to 2018. And whereas Myra Crook participated in the review and approval of two library strategic plans, a facilities master plan, and the purchase of the 10 Cliff View Drive property in Wentzville, Missouri. And whereas Myra Crook, one of the longest tenured board members, ensured continuous strong library leadership. And whereas Myra Crook served as a valuable liaison between the St. Charles City County Library District and St. Charles County government. And whereas Myra Crook's thoughtful approach to major decisions impacting library service helped to ensure wise action on the part of the library board. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Trustees of the St. Charles City County Library District hereby recognizes and conveys its gratitude to Myra Crook for her excellent service as a member of the Library Board of Trustees, for her dedicated service to the St. Charles City County Library District and all the taxpayers of St. Charles County and wishes her the best in future endeavors. Thank you very much. The uh, agenda item 2115, if you would read accordingly. I will. Do, uh, did you want to do a motion and approve each one individually or? We can do either way, I'm sorry. It's up to you. If you'd like to uh, do this, then we sure. need to just have a motion to approve each one. Just a motion to approve. Okay, yes. fine. Okay. Then I would entertain a motion to approve the resolution resolution in honor of Myra Crook. And Georgiana, it's Joanne. I I would really like to be the person to make that motion because Myra Please. has has uh, served with a great deal of distinction. And uh, I think when, you know, the county wanted her to stay on to pick a new director, I'm not sure she recognized it would be for an entire additional uh, sort of expired term plus, but she's right. been a trooper and been a wonderful liaison with the foundation and, um, I can't say how much uh, we've appreciated it both. I say that both as a board member and as a fellow county employee of hers. Um, and I know how much the county executive has appreciated her steady uh, presence on the board. Um, so I'd like to make the motion to approve the honor or the resolution in honor of Myra Crook. I agree and I would like to second that motion. Thank you both. I, I, I agree. Myra was president when I came on board and she was has been an inspiration throughout my tenure there. Do we need to go beyond the I think we have to vote. We need to to vote. Yes. Yes. Okay. To, just to approve. Those those in favor, please signal. Signify by saying aye. 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 I think it's by acclamation. I need not go through the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I the motion agree. is passed. <laughs> Agenda item 2115. Uh, Robin, would you do the honors again? Yes. The resolution. Resolution in honor of Mary Reese. And 
I will say that some things do sound a bit familiar, but they, they both served during the same time period. So resolution in honor of Mary Reese. Whereas Mary Reese has distinguished herself through her service to the St. Charles City County Library District as an appointee from the City of St. Charles to the Library Board of Trustees from 2008 to 2020. And whereas Mary Reese during her tenure as a trustee held the offices of secretary, treasurer, vice president, and president of the board. And whereas Mary Reese was instrumental in the process of recruiting and hiring new library directors in 2010 and 2017. And whereas Mary Reese served as treasurer and secretary of the board of trustees during the construction of the Spencer Road branch. And whereas Mary Reese served as the board of trustees representative to the library foundation board from 2017 to 2020. And whereas Mary Reese has held the office of president of the nonprofit library building corporation since 2008 and continues to serve in that role. And whereas Mary Reese participated in the review and approval of two library strategic plans, a facilities master plan and the purchase of the 10 Cliff View Drive property in Wentzville, Missouri. And whereas Mary Reese's thoughtful approach to major decisions impacting library service helped to ensure wise action on the part of the library board. Now therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Trustees of the St. Charles City County Library District hereby recognizes and conveys its gratitude to Mary Reese for her excellent service as a member of the Library Board of Trustees, for her dedicated service to the St. Charles City County Library District, and all the taxpayers of St. Charles County and wishes her the best in future endeavors. Robin, <clears throat> thank you, Robin. You're welcome. Do I have a motion to approve? I would like to make a motion on behalf, uh, this is Gail, in appreciation of Mary. And a second. I second. Thank you very much. All those who would approve, signify by saying aye. 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 And again, I will consider this approved by acclamation with your concurrence. I would like to add to my congratulations, personal congratulations and best wishes to Myra and to Mary. Please know that your presence and innumerable contributions to this board will be sorely missed. I think I speak for everyone in that regard. Thank you. Uh, it's a bit of a next move to our agenda 2116, which is a revision to policy EE 68368, sorry, the organization chart. This, um, Chart removed the Discovery Village branch, which closed on October 31, 2020, in anticipation of opening the Cliff View branch in early 2021. Um, we are <clears throat> requested as Board of Trustees to approve this revision. Do I have a motion to approve? This is Joanne, motion to approve the revision to the organizational chart removing Discovery Village and adding Cliffview Branch with its projected opening in early 2021. Thank you, Joanne. Is there a second? I will second. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice, so I may have to turn it over at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're getting close to being done. <laughs> so those against, and the motion is passed. Uh, our last agenda item is 2117, and um, that is our presentation, I think, that has been uh, prepared by Jason, so we would appreciate 
you taking the floor, Jason, and uh, sharing with us the financial overview. I will do that. Robin, you said we're almost done. Like, yeah, I'm going to talk for hours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me struggle with sharing my screen here. Just a moment. Um, just switch over here. Motion to cut the budget to take Jason's computer away. <laughs> um, I really am working on it. All right, you should all be seeing a scintillating blank screen now, correct? Yep. You betcha. OK. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to do today is just give sort of a brief, very high level um, look at the, our, the library's current financial situation and kind of do a historical look at our budget um, and revenues and operating expenditures in particular. And this is something that I did with our management staff a couple of weeks ago, and I will be sending um, that recording actually, or perhaps the recording of, of this one to all staff as well, because I think it is really important that sort of all levels of the organization reach a common, sort of have a common understanding about um, sort of this high level look at the budget. So, um, so to just start real briefly, um, covering our sources of revenue, um, and this, this is for fiscal year 20, so as, as Julie mentioned earlier, we are on a July through June fiscal year, so fiscal year 20 is our most recently completed fiscal year, um, ended in June, and total revenues were just over um, $20.5 million, and um, sort of like most public libraries, the vast majority of those revenues come from property taxes. So 95%, um, um, both real and personal property. So that is just under 19 and a half million. And you see on this slide, the other sources of revenue as well. Um, there's a little bit of other tax revenue in, in the form of the arts and entertainers tax and, and state aid. Um, we do receive a number of grants from outside organizations, and we include in that our sort of affiliate organizations in the Library Foundation and the Friends of the Library. They are um, separate 501 c 3 so they are um, affiliated but independent organizations that do grant money back to, to the library. Um, and then there's sort of this catch-all of other and a lot of those things are reimbursable. So from copy machines, that's really just reimbursing the supplies from those copy machines. Um, we no longer charge overdue fines. So that piece is, is no longer there, but it was there for most of, of fiscal 20. Um, um, so if you think in terms of, there's, this really only covers a couple of months of sort of COVID reality, really March through June. So um, we do know that many of these things, particularly in the other category, passport fees, for instance, um, we have not had been a passport acceptance agency since March. Um, so we are seeing decreases in a number of these areas. And one thing that I did not um, this slide was not part of the presentation that I gave to staff um, for no other reason than I, I didn't think to include it, but I think it is important because I think it, it's good to see where we sit in relationship to the other two major um, library districts in the St. Louis metropolitan area. And that's not because, you know, I want to advocate that any funding level is, is the right funding level but because we so often compare ourselves and, and by we, I mean staff and the public in terms of everything from, you know, internally management structure to compensation structure to staffing, um, to size of collection, to, to programs we offer and, and all of that. And, and that makes a lot of sense because um, there is some overlap in audience and, and of course, we're going to look at what the, the other two major districts are doing, but 
we have to do that within the context of also looking at the funding levels and see that our per capita tax revenue here in St. Charles City County Library is substantially less than um, both St. Louis County Library and the St. Louis Public Library. Um, and I, I won't spend a, a, a ton of time here, but one question that I receive a lot from staff every year when the board passes the tax rate is how does the tax rate relate to property values? And if property values are going up, doesn't that lead to more revenue? And I mean, it does, but not as much as you would think. And, and the reason is because of the Hancock Amendment, which is an amendment to the Missouri Constitution that was passed in 1980 that, you know, and this is a, a very simple nutshell, limits the amount of revenues the increase in revenues collected from existing real property to being capped at the rate of inflation. So what that means is when we see property values increase and assessments go up, if that would have if that would result in an increase in our real tax revenues that exceeds the rate of inflation, we are obligated by law to roll our tax rate back. So that doesn't happen. And, and that, that did happen um, a couple of years ago. So, and I got questions from staff, like why are, why are you reducing the tax rate? Isn't that leaving money on the table? And the answer is no, it, we have to be, um, we have to comply with the Hancock Amendment. The only way to increase revenues beyond that threshold is to go to the voters to approve a tax increase. Um, and, and just real quickly, it, this does this applies to existing property so population growth more um you know more homes being built etc we do see revenue increases from that but it also we also see more people we have to serve so the per capita incomes essentially stays the same in those cases so that is very much a simplification um but that that is something that is important to understand so looking at um, a history of our revenue from, this is from all sources, so tax revenue, but all the others over the course from 2004 to 2020, and this is by fiscal year. So 2004 would be July of 2003 to June of 2004. Um, we see a 64% increase in our, our revenues for over, over that time period. And like I said, this is this is from all sources, but usually that that pie chart holds true that about 95% of our revenue is going to come from property taxes. And one of the reasons why we wanted to to do this is because we are in kind of an unknown situation. All taxing entities are in an unknown situation right now because we don't know what kind of downturn we're looking at um, and and how long it's going to last and one of the things we can do is is look back at the last one we had which was in 2008 and kind of draw conclusions from what happened then and it, you know we don't know this one is caused by a, a a pandemic that one was caused by more economic factors they're they're not the same but it is a a, a set of data that we can look at so when you kind of divide these years in into chunks sort of the pre-2008 and then the five years after 2008, um, we can definitely see some changes happen. And from 2004 to 2008, we were actually seeing an, an average annual increase of 8% in, in our revenues, which is, is pretty extraordinary. Kind of big growth in St. Charles County, um, you know, economic growth as well. Um, but then in 2008, you can see what happens to to the chart, it actually dips for a number of years, and then it starts a slow a slow increase. But at the end of the day, five years later, we were at pretty much exactly the same place we were in two thousand and eight. So we were flat. Um, and and like I said, I I don't know if that will hold true, but it is something that we can look back on and say, all right, well, maybe that that's what we have to think about over the next five years. And then you could see from 2013 on, we were averaging about 3% annual increase. So it definitely is certainly not that 8%. Um, 
and so it has slowed some. That is, is from that period from 2013 through 2020. If we, we look at just the last four years, the most recent, we are seeing a trend that there is a decrease. I mean, 4% for 17 and 18, but then 3% in 19, 2% in 2020. Um, and as I said, there's only a, a couple months worth of sort of COVID experience in that. So this is really just a trend under normal circumstances. And there's a number of reasons, obviously going fine free is one of them. Um, so we're, but in general, the shift and actually TJ, this is sort of an unintended consequence of electronic materials. They can't be overdue. So even if you have overdue fines, libraries see in, as more electronic materials that that revenue produced by overdue fines um, decreases. And so we have been seeing that for a number of years. Um, so, but that's the picture right now, a historical picture up until our, our most recently completed fiscal year of, of our revenues. So then uh, looking at types of expenditures, one of the things that I, I think is a point of confusion sometimes is um, the difference really between operating expenditures and capital expenditures and what are recurring expenditures and what that means and what are one-time expenditures. So I, I think I can, I can completely understand someone being confused by you're building a branch that you want a building for $1.4 million, but we can't get raises this year. And, and the fact is there's really, those are from two different pools and completely different sets of circumstances. And the majority of our expenditures every year fall under that general operating category. So these are the things that are required day to day for the functioning of the library, salaries and benefits. You know, we, we have, you know, what, what we pay people, um, our collections, subscriptions, utilities, just the day to day operating expenditures. Um, significant is that these are typically recurring. So um, yeah, we, we, we pay staff this year, we'll have to pay them next year. We buy collections this year, we'll have to buy collections next year. Generally then to sort of curtail general operating expenditures, it means cutting something um, because you know, these are things that once you initiate them, they are recurring. As Julie mentioned earlier in her report, we are required by law to present a balanced budget. So, you know, we cannot exceed our revenue in a given year for general operating expenditures. Even if that wasn't a law, we wouldn't want to do it just because, you know, obviously in your own household, if you are dipping into your savings to pay your mortgage, you will run out of money at some point. That is not sustainable. That's the very definition of living beyond your means. Um, and so looking at the, the breakdown of our general operating expenditures, as I mentioned, um, it really was the bulk, $19.4 million. If you think back, that's about what our tax revenue was last year. So the majority, if, if not all, went to general operating expenditures. And, and here's the, the general breakdown of those, about 65% salaries and benefits. That is very typical of, of most organizations. Our, our product, so to speak, our materials are about 17%. Um, I do want to highlight that the 2% technology and communication, this is operating expenditures. So these are things like prescrip prescription, subscriptions, um, licenses, the phone bill. This is not the capital infrastructure, uh, technology infrastructure, it's the recurring expenditures. Um, but that, that infrastructure would fall under the capital expenditure side. And these are the one-time things to um, acquire and maintain physical assets or equipment. So this is, you know, in the new HVAC. This is the replacing of the roof. This is the any renovation, maintenance of buildings, a fleet of that technology infrastructure. These are one time. The, the, you know, they, we replace the roof once and then we don't have to replace it until we need to replace it again. It's important to maintain these. You do falling, deferring maintenance is, is a recipe for disaster as well. But these are the things that, um, these do not necessarily need to be 
funded in their entirety by your revenues that particular year. This is what you saved for. Um, and some examples from the last fiscal year, we spent just over $2 million in capital expenditures. The majority of that was the purchase of our Cliffview building, which was 1.4 million. Uh, but you see some of the other, the other major things that we spent last year. And I highlight some of them just because to get an idea of the scale, one of the things, it, it's, a, it's a very simple thing, putting shelves in the restrooms at all of our locations. Like a really good thing to do, cost $11,000, you know, um, spend almost $25,000 just in general painting and, you know, wall repair, these, these things um, that occur. You see, to this point, the work at Catherine Linneman um, was about $175,000 last fiscal year. So, um, and and the, the hot water work at Spencer Road, that is actually still something that we, we have finally, fingers are crossed, rectified a situation that has persisted at Spencer Road since it was built. So, um, you know, these, these are significant expenditures and they come up. We are looking at right now a five-year capital investment um, of about $5 million over the next five years. This does this is, is really just maintenance of facilities. This does not include security or technology infrastructure um, that would be on top of that. So, you know, these aren't necessarily going to be divided up evenly over those five years, but just thinking about it logically, we would need to average putting a million dollars aside every year to meet these five million dollars of obligations over the next five years. Um, and unfortunately, as, as you know, this year with COVID and budgeting conservatively, we didn't budget, we essentially budgeted flat. We did not budget to put, uh, I think it was $27,000 into reserves was it. So that is not something that can be sustained even for another year. Um, and so this is something that I, I thought it was a good something to show for staff, just thinking through and, and relating how we operate to how their household budget might operate. And you know, we're all people, most of our income comes from our paycheck. You know, we, we might have investment income here and there. I think my savings account, I got 38 cents last month. Um, but you know, all of us, most of our income comes from our paycheck. Just like our revenue, we have sources, but most of it comes from property taxes. And we receive that revenue and we have to divide it up. Most of it goes towards our general operating expenditures, just like you and I, most of our paycheck goes towards our daily living, so pays our mortgage, buys our groceries, um, pays our utility bills, etc. Um, but um, you know, provided we can, some of that paycheck also needs to go into savings or what we would call reserves at the library. And there's multiple buckets within that. One of them is operating reserves. And you know, I think this could loosely be kind of thought of as that emergency fund that your financial advisor will tell you you have to have. Um, really, for the library, and, and Julie mentioned it in, his, in her report, we get a bulk of our revenues sort of all at once, but our expenditures are spread out throughout the year. So we do have to have an operating reserve to cover cash flow purposes. But then also, we need our capital reserves. And you know, thinking in terms of your home budget, this might be saving for the next car down payment or a, a vacation or you know, knowing that you're going to need to replace your roof at some point. So, but the message, of course, is that from our revenues, we have to fund the operating expenditures, which cannot exceed our revenues, and also make sure we are saving for these other future expenditures. So, um, to zero in on the operating expenditures, those are really, I think, when we're looking at where we are as an organization, it's what is happening with those operating expenditures and how do they relate to our, um, our annual, annual revenues. And so um, here we have put the total operating expenditures against the operating revenues or the, the total revenues that we have received since 2004. 
And so again, this does not include capital. If this included capital, it would be much less of a steady flow because some years we would spend a lot more, um, some years we would spend a lot less. This is just those recurring expenditures that they're going to come every year. And um, we see that in the same period that our revenues increased 64%, our operating expenditures increased 85%. So obviously, big picture, we can see that what we're spending on operating expenses is outpacing our, our revenues. Looking at sort of those same time chunks, until 2008, our annual revenue increases were 8%. But our average increases in our operating expenditures were five percent. So that difference was actually growing. Um, we were were spending less every year than we were bringing in. However, then for that next five year where we averaged flat, we didn't curtail much. Um, the average increase in um, operating expenditures did go down a bit, but just increased about 4%. And I think this speaks to what I said earlier that it's really hard to curtail your operating expenditures because it really means cutting something. Um, and so they continued to increase at a, at a rate of 4% a year while our revenue in some years went down. Um, but at the end of the day, five years later, we're flat. And then since 2013, we have um, averaging about a 3% annual increase. Um, so it, it has slowed a bit, but if you look at those same most recent four years that we looked at with revenue, at the exact time the revenue is decreasing, the expenditures are increasing. So 3%, 3%, 2%, and then the last two years, they've increased 5% each year. Very good reasons for this, things that needed to be done but it, we are, I think this to me, I'm, I'm a visual person. So, I mean, this really drives the point home to me that, you know, in, in 2004, there was a 16% difference between our average, you know, what we were bringing in and what we were spending on, on operating costs. And last year, that was only 5%. And in that early period, up until 2008, where revenue increases were outpacing expenditure increases, we had actually increased, increased, increased that gap up to 2008. There was a 24% difference. So you can imagine that left us very well situated for an economic downturn, right? Um, but then by the end of that five-year period, it has shrunk back down to only 8%. So what does that then mean for us, um, where we are now almost certainly facing another economic downturn? Well, it, it means we're not in the position in 2020 that we were in 2008 to be able to weather that in the same way. And um, I think that that is obviously something that is, is concerning. And it's not only concerning just because of COVID. Like I mentioned, this doesn't, this experience is sort of up to COVID. So even without COVID, we're, we're clearly facing something that if things continue on the path, that purple line and that pink line are going to cross in the fairly near future and, and they can't. So we are going to have to face some choices. And I'm going to uh, stop sharing now, I think. Um, and so I guess what that means is, uh, on, on the one hand, I think this to me sets sort of a, a, a baseline reset of the organization right now. And in many ways, I think, you know, I would, I would never say, you know, well, I, I won't even go there. We we're in a situation with COVID that there's sort of been a break in service. And, and I think that can sort of be a blessing because um, a lot of what we were used to in the library has changed and it changed very quickly and it changed, it was abrupt and it was beyond our control. But I think it gives us an opportunity to reset now. And we are starting that work from an organizational level where we are, are, are mapping out what does the library look like in 2025? You know, and, and how do we get there? 
what services do we need to provide um, in 2025? And the financial piece is absolutely a piece of it. How are we going to sustain our operations, you know, to 2025 and then beyond? And honestly, I think it is exciting, but it's also something that I think needs a commitment from everyone in the organization, from every part-time page through all of you on the board. I mean, I think that that's where we need to be and we need to sort of face the situation head on. So um, I know I kind of end it in this, the, the, the most significant critique of this when I gave it to managers was, wow, you just mic dropped it this horrible cliff and then walked away. Um, and yeah, it is sort of a thud at the end, but I think that's good. And, and like I said, it's, it's the thud and now it's like, all right, let's move forward and how are we going to face this and how are we going to change and what are we going to look like and that's an exciting thing so um i'm happy to answer any questions i mean obviously there's no action that i'm looking for you um from now i'm just sort of setting the table so to speak an interesting I, I, analysis yeah, I really appreciate your um, your candor and really you know walking us through that. It's very helpful. Um, many organizations are going through the same conversations right now, and uh, you know very challenging times across the board. Future is unknown, um, but you know we do have a chance to guide what that future looks like. Uh, so I appreciate you taking that um, taking that stance. Uh, just a quick question: um, I know that you're involving your staff. You've you've involved them. You've presented this. Uh, what future involvement will they have in helping set that path to the future? So at this point, um, we have, as, as an executive team, the folks who are, who are here with you today, we have really mapped out sort of a framework for your library 2025. And that has yet to really be seen by even our administrative and management team. Um, <laughs> that would have been talked about this week. But we had to close some branches because of COVID, so that kind of jumped ahead. Um, but at, at this point, we will be um, really empowering a steering committee of our, it, it will be sort of higher level managers, but not me and, and not the executive team. It will be people who are delivering the day-to-day -day service with a number of subcommittees that focus on specific things like staffing and, and ser service and technology. And they will really help lead that, that process. We have some, some sort of non-negotiables that they have to look at and that they have to um, make some decisions around. But beyond that, it really will be up to them to help guide um, the future. Thank you. Really, now more than ever, it's important to be proactive and not reactive. And that's what you're doing by plotting ahead. And uh, it can be exciting. I think that the staff will be very appreciative of the ability to participate in it. Yeah. I agree, and thank you for sharing that, Jason. What, what expectations do you have for us as board members? What would our role be? Because I'm um, ready to jump in and see where you know we can help. Well, I, I think asking questions is important. Um, it is, you know, I said when I, when I met with you earlier, you're bringing a perspective that I don't have. And, um, you know, I feel pretty strongly that everyone in the organization plays a role. And if any one level of that organization isn't playing their role, the whole organization is going to fail because they're looking at a specific thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think probably the most significant thing I think is really that that we have a unified voice. And because it is an exciting time, but it is also a really scary time. And, um, it, and even I had, you know, like I said, I, I can look back at this chart and go, oh my gosh, in 2010, you were still spending that much. Well, but that's hindsight. They didn't, you know, they made the decisions they had with the information that they had available to them at that time. And they were the right decisions for that time. And, um, but so, so I mean, I think that that speaks to people are invested in, in decisions and the way things were done in the past. And 
things will probably have to change more than they have and they'll probably have to change more quickly than they have in the past. So I think it is really important that I think the board and, and I think all the staff understand that that the board um, and you look at the org chart, you'll notice I'm not at the top of it and you're not at the top of it. The community is at the top of it and that um, it's really the community's needs that dictate what we do and that the board sort of works with the staff and supports the direction of the staff and, and understands that that there may be challenges, um, but and that choice, I think choices will have to be made. And that um, I think sort of supports those choices, I think will be very, very important. I just like to offer a, a bit of advice if I can, my two cents for the night. And that's one to, to definitely be proactive and uh, to be as transparent as you can be, because that, that's going to be critical. And as many levels within the organization that you can involve in that decision, the better off. Okay. Thank you. And I'd like to add something, <clears throat> if I may. Please, Gail. Julie. It's Julie. So as far as speaking to I'm going to back up a little bit. Jason was talking about reserves. So we aren't, we have a $20 million budget and we're not funded until the seventh month of our fiscal year. So as you can see, he referred to the 5 million, which is right now, given our existing buildings, what will be needed just to maintain those in the next five years. So that is 5 million. Um, and benchmark, as far as a general operating, your safety reserve would be about 15 to 20% of your annual budget. So we should have about three and a half million reserved for that. So when you, when you look at our reserve, so to speak, eight and a half million need to, needs to stay in you know, our account for those purposes. So um, that being said, we are supporting with $20 million, 13 buildings. So we have, I believe, uh, let's see, seven, eight, nine, 11 branches now without, we closed Portage, Discovery Village was just closed. We're adding Clipview. With that, we've got an administrative office and then we also have a warehouse. So aside from the warehouse, we have people in all of those buildings. So when you think about that many buildings and $20 million worth of budget, um, it could be very challenging. So as far as that support, seeing where we are going into January, as far as the funding, because we do have that concentration risk, right? With real and personal property taxes, um, that will be our starting point. And really it's based on that, what we're going to do with our operating expenses. Um, one of the things that I have seen, we're switching to you know, a more digital environment there's been pressure from even our existing vendors as far as when you get into the cloud computing and the digital environment and subscriptions um, with the cybersecurity, the events that are happening, these vendors are pushing back. They're trying to push the costs back onto um, their customers. So in the past, you've seen an average of a 3% cost increase per year you know, when you're looking at that. And now I've seen them try to get away with 6%, 9%, I had one approach me with 17% increase. Um, so having to push back and negotiate that, it's like, I, I think that's a challenging area. So that's just, you know, one thing that, you know, looking at the changing technology, the way we do business, you know, trying to get a handle on things such as that while preparing a budget is also very important, what that looks like going forward. So um, those are just a few things, but Yes, it's like as far as having board support and kind of working through what our budget looks like for the coming years, you know, it's gonna be very important. Well, you use the technology word, so I have to jump in. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm more than willing to help out wherever possible. So if there is a, a committee that's focused, focusing on technology and trying to get control over the subscription rates, because you were right on the money, uh, Julie. I mean, the, uh, the amount of um, expense, the operational side of the expense, is going way up for cloud services versus your traditional capital expenditure model. Uh, so it's a big shift, you know, where that money is uh, is being used. So uh, use me as you guys see fit. If you need a just a second set of eyes to, to look at uh, portfolio, I'm ready to go. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? It's a stimulating one and a challenging one. But we are, as board members, I'm sure you all agree, willing to help in every way that we can and feel free to call upon any of us. Each of us brings something different to the table and, and as you just expressed, that's important to add those perspectives as we move forward. Thank you. Challenging and stimulating, that describes 2020. Thank you. Jason, good job. Very, very. I very agree, Jason. Very well done. Thank you. Lots of time, thought went into it, and it's a great visual. And uh, we really appreciate the time and effort that went into it. It's uh, helpful to all of us. Great. Thank you. Anything further? If not, uh, that concludes our business, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Any second? I'll second. See, nobody wants to leave. <laughs> OK, all right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The meeting is adjourned, and thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Well, Bye. We'll see you next month, old. Stay healthy. Bye -bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Mary and Myra. Bye, Myra. Take care. Well, Mary's not there, is she? No, Mary wasn't able oh, to attend. Myra no. really stayed this whole time. Myra stayed the whole time. I did. I was, <laughs> I was debating. I'm like, okay. I thought this was going to be a short one. I'm going to drop. And then I'm like, hey, I'll sit here a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh.